it's not just the sophistication that police say is troubling, but the lack of suspects or a motive. When something unexplained like this happens, of course, people go nuts speculating about what it could be. That's actually what our program is about today. In this case, the media pondered whether the tunnel would be used to plant a bomb at the upcoming Pan Am Games nearby. The Pan Am Games are like an Olympics for North and South and Central America. Or maybe somebody was going to build a meth lab in the tunnel, or an operation to grow marijuana, or they would use the tunnel to hide foreign athletes from the Pan Am Games who might want to stay in Canada illegally. On Twitter, it was hashtag terror tunnel. But the truth of what was going on in that tunnel and what its purpose was, was nothing like any of that. And the way the Canadian police figured it out, okay, first of all, can I say, sometimes one is reminded of what a very different country Canada is from the United States. As part of the manhunt for whoever built the tunnel, a policeman tweeted, if you build a tunnel near the Rexall Center in Toronto, give us a call, okay? The Toronto police pointed out that it is not illegal to dig a hole. Apparently no law was broken. On the spot, they said they saw no evidence of terrorism, and they did not want to jump to conclusions. For instance, here's an exchange between then Toronto Deputy Chief Mark Saunders and reporters after he showed him a photo of that rosary and plastic poppy. This was found inside the actual tunnel itself, and it was nailed on the uh, on the wall. This was nailed. TV and showed pictures of the stuff that they found in the tunnel, a ladder and the generator and the sump pump, and they asked the public, is this jog anybody's memory? Anybody know anything about this stuff? And that turned out to be exactly the right move, because watching that coverage was a guy named Boko Merrick. He sees that ladder, and I said to myself, they look exactly like my stepladder, and I bet you any money this is mine. <laughs> I bet you any money this is mine. And then when I saw sump pump, I said, whoa, whoa, my stepladder and something. But I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe, like, I couldn't believe myself. I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about that. He couldn't sleep because he knew who he'd given the stuff to. Bob is a contractor. And he lent that stuff to one of his favorite employees, this young guy, he's 22, Elton. What was Elton doing? I come to think that Elton had been asking to borrow a lot of tools lately. He was asking me for a shop. So many tools, eh? I just would say, okay, if you need, take it. Boko loves Elton. He goes that Elton's a great worker. He goes that, unlike other young people Bob's worked with in the past, apparently, Elton always wants to learn, asks lots of questions. What do you do when you do the roof? How you connect this? How you put joist hangers? What is this distance between and that? Can I do this instead of that? Is this going to carry this support? Unbelievable, you know? And I joke with everybody. If everybody asks me, who is that guy? This is my adopted son, <laughs> Elton. Always I used to say, this is my adopted son. Okay. So I would lend him any tools he wanted. So, morning after he sees the police pointing to a photo of his ladder and sump pump on television, he goes to pick up Elton to bring him to work, like always. Elton gets in the truck. He brought two coffees for me and him. And I said, Elton, Tell me one thing, uh, that some pump, I didn't even ask full question. He said, Boko, <laughs> yes, I did. Oh my God. Boko went to the authorities and made sure that Elton would not get arrested or go to prison for this. And then he turned him in. The police talked to Elton, satisfied themselves that Elton was not a terrorist or an evil criminal mastermind, but just some guy. And they let him go. They didn't even give him a fine. Though they did suggest that he not dig more tunnels. Canada. So, who is Elton? Why did he do it? Why go to the trouble? Well, Elton has not given many interviews. Though he did allow one reporter named Nick Kohler to spend a couple days with him and his family to write this long story about them in McLean's magazine. And Nick was able to tell us a lot about Elton. Elton turned down our request for an interview. Elton lives maybe two minutes from the ravine and woods where the tunnel was found in a kind of rough neighborhood in public housing. Nick says both of his parents are from Jamaica. He lives with two sisters, uh, an older sister and a younger sister, and, and they all live with their, their mother. Elton's the quiet kid in the family. Nick says everybody else is a big talker. And I think in particular, uh, his older sister, Honora, she, she has a lot of uh, ideas about um, how Elton uh, should be uh, living his life. 
and she's not shy about kind of sharing that with him. Uh, she's a big fan of self-help books, and so I think Elton uh, is often in the position of, of listening to um, life talks, uh, as they, they put it. Advice. Advice. And Elton found refuge ever since he was a kid uh, in the ravine. In the ravine, there were no life talks. And from the time he was little, Elton was this introspective kid who loved to build, to take machines apart and put them back together. He fixed up old lawnmowers, he built clubhouses. And like you said in a short interview that Nick recorded for a video that McLean's magazine made, he'd go to the ravine. Okay, what I used to do in the ravine when I was a kid is run around, play, hide and go seek. We'd play like apple, or we'd go fishing. But um, I started my first tunnel probably when I was in um, elementary school. I was going to the creek, walk around, and this was something on my mind. I wanted to go to the clubhouse. I had five or six attempts, and I think the sixth one was the huge sound that I found. I've heard him call it the sort of the future of clubhouses. Again, here's Nick. The, the tree house of the future, um, that it's underground because one of the fundamental things he wanted from this was that it be it be secret. It was his secret place that he could go and just relax and, and be alone. But not always alone. A friend helped out and dig the tunnel and build it, excavating, he thinks, two dump trucks of dirt by hand. And once it was done, they would go there together, watch movies, listen to music, barbecue. Okay, I did this because something I always wanted to be doing, but I know, like, I should have grown out of it. And I knew that, okay, if I build a tunnel, it came from childhood reasons, but at the same time, if I build it, who knows, I could probably hang out there, turn that childhood dream into like a man cave, a bunker, whatever we call it, just a place to go hang out. And if there was something to happen, like a natural disaster, if something would happen, I could go there. If there's a blackout, um, turn on a generator, charge my phone, even make a small meal down there just to bring back up to my house. sisters did not know exactly what he was doing, but they knew something was up. For months, uh, while he was digging the thing, he would come home just covered in dirt, tracking dirt everywhere. And Nora thought he was building some kind of underground house and grilled him about it, but he wouldn't say. His other sister, Tracy Ann, found the rosary actually sitting at a bus stop and gave it to Elton to protect him. So as soon as like, soon she gave it to me, like an hour later, I was already down there. I nailed it up. Every day, after that day, every day where I would go there, I would sometimes make a prayer. Not every day, some days I'll forget. But sometimes I'll remember to have a little prayer just so I'm safe and just a peace of mind. Yeah. The reality of Elton's tunnel, it was so different from what people thought it was when it was first discovered by police. And I think what that's about is, I think when we encounter something inexplicable or mysterious, our imaginations, we are such hacks. You know, we go to the most standard, stock, seen it in a hundred TV shows version of what something probably is. Like, oh, it's a terrorist attack. Oh, it's drug dealers, you know? When the reality of what this tunnel really was, it was this dreamy guy who just wanted a place to get away from his sisters and be alone for a little while. It's so much smaller, but so much less predictable and way more interesting. Well, today on our program, what's going on in there? We have stories where people think that they know exactly what is going on in situations of various kinds, and we get inside and find out just how much more interesting the reality of all of it is. From WBEC Chicago, it's This American Life. I'm Ira Glass. Stay with us. That one, I can explain. The story is about a teenager in a situation where everybody in her life Thought they knew exactly what was going on with her and what she should do. It seemed so clear to everybody else, and she would not do it. This teenager met a producer from public radio station WNYC, a producer named Courtney Stein, two years ago. And Courtney works on this project called Radio Rookies. And the teenager, her name is Rainey, she was 17 years old at the time. She applied to be in Radio Rookies program. She wanted to make a radio story, and she wanted to talk about how she had been in an abusive relationship for a long time. I was trying to figure out why she stayed in it for so long. And Courtney, the radio producer, was not sure that Rainey was ready to tell that story. It just seemed so soon. But 
Rainey wanted to, and the principal thought it would be a good idea because it would give Rainey a reason to come to school, which at the time she needed. So Courtney said, okay, here's Rainey back then. Recording? Yeah, she's recording. I'm recording. This is live recording coming from West Brooklyn's community AC office. I started reporting the story in the fall of 2013. So this is Rainey Lorraine, 